pleasant surprise. My guest is Johnson Chiku. He's the Group Managing Director at Carry Assets Management. He was supposed to join us virtually. That was the agreement. But he just popped into the studio. <laughs> pleasant surprise. Welcome to you, <laughs> Chief Chuku. <laughs> Chief Nancy, thank you for having me. <laughs> Welcome to the program. Uh, we haven't seen after the election, but we'll come back to the election. Uh, we haven't seen, yes. The last time we saw was before the election. Yeah, before even the presidential election. Yes, uh, so we'll talk about that in a bit. Let's let me have your insights ab uh, about uh, the MPC uh, meeting that is underway uh, right uh, now. Uh, wh what are your own macro perspectives vis-a-vis -vis what you think the MPC will do today? Which way do you think that the MPC will swing? Well, um, uh, the way I would look at it is uh, what I would have voted if I was a member of uh, the mm -hmm. MPC. And my vote would have been to hold rates at current levels. If you recall the last MPC meeting, they, they increased rates. Um, but beyond that, the increments we've seen in rates has, has not translated into lower inflation. We've seen inflation move up uh, by 9 basis points from 21.82% to 21.91%. Uh, beyond that, you also have to deal with issue of contradictory uh, economic factors that are con currently tugging the economy on in different direction. Uh, we just finished uh, the national elections, so you're going to have a transition to a new government. Uh, beyond that, th then you also have to consider the fact that the economy, in terms of economic recovery, uh, the economy grew by only 3.1 percent last year. Uh, down from about 3.4% in the preceding year. Uh, in as much as you saw an improvement in growth from 2.25% to 2.54% in the last quarter, of the, from the third quarter of the last quarter of last year. But those growth are still suboptimal. We saw an agricultural sector that has slowed down because of uh, uh, issues around insecurity, around flooding. Uh, you still have high level of unemployment. So the focus of the MPC should be how do we stimulate economic growth? Uh, given the fact that you are trying to fight inflation and inflation pressures are not driven by excess liquidity. And even the excess liquidity in the economy is not driven by private uh, credit uh, or private sector credit expansion. It's largely driven by ways and means funding of the federal government. So you really cannot stifle um, the economy, particularly the private sector, by inc further increasing rates um, when that effort has not led to lower inflation rates. And most importantly, the inflationary pressure is not driven by excess liquidity. So my take would be, let's keep raising the current level and watch the environment. The other factor that are, uh, will be affecting the MPC is the issue of uh, pressure on exchange rates. We've seen, despite the positive uh, trade balance we witnessed uh, in the last uh, report, we are also still, we are still seeing depletion and reserve. So the question you want to ask yourself is, um, do I want to lower rates? If I lower rates, then I could actually see more pressure on the FX because you could see it and it, an uptick in demand for imports. So I, I, in, in that wise, you are caught between the pressures to increase rates and the pressures to lower rates. And if you look at those pressures, so your most appropriate decision should be to keep rates at current level. Mm. So th the, the decision to keep it up at common level, I'm trying to... At to current level. Yes, at current level, which is at 17.5%. I'm trying to understand what may be the basis for that. Should it still be inflation taming or should it be uh, giving the economy a bit of stability? I yeah. hope you, you understand yeah, what, yes, what, what I'm saying. Yes, absolutely. For, for, for <laughs> uh, I think what the uh, MPC will be saying, look, we increased it to 17.5% uh, at the last meeting. So let's watch and see the impact of that. Because there's always what you call lag effect. Mm -hmm. If you take a decision, an, an economic decision today, the impact is not going to be instantaneous. So the increase we had in uh, monetary policy rates to 17.5% is just a period of two months. So we've not seen that impact. So of course, if you look at the February inflation figure, um, it's not based on the figures as of March. So the figure you reported for February was also had a lag effect, given when the data was collected. So I if you now want to increase rate, you have to ask yourself, have I fully weighed in the impact of the increment I had la in, uh, in January? Or in the alternative, if you want to reverse that, will that be consistent? Okay, why not take a look at this scenario? So sorry to <coughs> bother you. 
um, NPR was raised at the January meeting 17.5%. Bear in mind that inflation depreciated in December. And it took a lot of people by surprise because December ordinarily is a holiday season. A lot of people attend to, to spend it more. But that did not happen. And inflation, it was still high, but it just decreased a bit. Still, the MPC increased rates, which a lot of people said, okay, we're seeing inflation decelerating. Why increase rate? Why not even hold it at that point? February inflation, uh, uptick, yes. January inflation, uptick, actually. So you've seen two opticks as against one depreciation in December. So where does it really now leave <laughs> the MPC? How do they, you know, that go? Okay, in the uh, you have to recognize the fact that uh, the drop we saw in December was a flash. Flash of what? Yeah, it was a, it had a, fl it was a flash effect. Uh, was it the currency... But as at that time, it was people were still spending all yeah, the money. Yeah, people were spending money. And remember that what happened in December was um, a lot of Nigerians come home uh, in December, and then you have some level of stability in exchange rate. And when you have stability in exchange rate, uh, you, you certainly have that impact uh, on import uh, induced inflation. Of course, uh, MB MBS has come up with another um, category, which is based on import induced uh, impact on the f on, on consumer prices so if you have a a, a, a a group a consumption group that has a major drop you could have that flash effect mm -hmm. but it clearly it wasn't a consistent pattern and everyone of us knew that it wasn't going to be a sustainable pattern because the basic factor of driving inflation had not uh, fundamentally changed mm -hmm. issue of food prices had not fundamentally changed. Issue of pressure on exchange rate had not fundamentally changed. Issues around the price of energy, fuel had not fundamentally changed. So we knew that any drop, any beat we saw in that trend was going to be temporary. So it couldn't have been a basis for anybody to make a judgment call and say, okay, look, rates have uh, dropped, let's see, uh, uh, I mean, inflation had dropped, let's reduce monetary policy rates. Mm. What other headwinds do you think that may be considered at this meeting? Headwind, of course, we've talked about inflation. Um, we've talked about also the foreign exchange risk. Are there some other headwinds that you think that members of the MPC will be considering right now in the room that we may not even be seeing? Yeah, I, I, I think uh, one of the things they should consider is the fact that the global financial system is going mm. through some turmoil. Uh, we've just seen the acquisition of Credit Suisse a once a seven year old bank by UBS and that mm. acquisition was basically forced mm -hmm. by the uh, Swiss Central Bank. We've seen a collapse of SV SVP, yeah. that is um, 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 say, um, Silicon Valley Bank, Silicon Valley bank uh, a 22 billion uh, dollar bank balance sheet. Uh, and then we've also seen other smaller regional banks go down with it. We've seen the First Republic Bank collapse. We've seen a signature bank collapse in America. And what that has happened, and remember that uh, uh, Credit Suisse had a balance sheet of more than 1.6 trillion mm. uh, dollars, which is more than the entire GDP of Africa. So with that collapse, with that first acquisition, the entire finan global financial system is in a state of st severe apprehension. And you should also know that because of that, if the global economy goes, financial market goes into a spin is certainly affect the Nigerian financial system. And we know that when the banking system is going through difficulties or going through a period of um, uh, um, instability, credit expansion drops. Okay. Let me hold, just hold your thoughts there. Let's take a break. And let's use this break if my uh, team is listening. Let's take a look. Let's play back what Godwin M. Eferi, the governor of the Central Bank, did say at the African Central Bank's conference in Joburg, just as Johannesburg, just a few days ago, talking about banking regulations, talking about what you just spoke about, the collapse of SVB, uh, and what is being expected by central bankers to do at this point. If we have that, we can play that very quickly, and we'll come back to the conversation. In Nigeria, people have always said that Nigerian banking, Nigerian banking system appears to be more one of the most regulated, in fact, stringently regulated banking system. We have, we, 
done a couple of things. We are not saying that there are no runs. We, we are not saying that there are no in cases where there are banks run into a liquidity crisis in Nigeria. But we try as much as possible to make sure that we've done our best to make sure that we protect the banks and protect, insulate the banking system from the from uh, serious occurrences like like this. In, I think it's only in Nigeria, among very very few countries in the world, that will hear you will hear about the Central Bank of Nigeria insisting that if you, a bank, you collect, say, for instance, hundred dollars from a customer as deposit, that today. 32.5 dollars of that money must be kept at the CBN. It is to is to keep that fund to meet sh this kind of situations when there are crises. It's only in Nigeria or one of those countries in the world, Nigeria, that you will find that we insist that banks must maintain a particular level of specified liquid assets as a percentage of their deposits, which we call the liquidity ratio. It's in Nigeria, one of the countries in the world, Nigeria, that you will find that we insist that banks must maintain, maintain some minimum level of capital adequacy ratios. No, it will be difficult for you to run away from crises like this where uh, banks, in an attempt to make money, take um, unnecessary risks that will crystallize and create problems and may lead to their demise. Right, that's what uh, Godwin Mefele, the governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, are talking about a banking regulation and the vigilance that should be on banks right now, especially with the demise, or almost demise of some banks <laughs> that one would ordinarily not think about. Johnson Chuko, the group managing director at Carrier Asset Management, is still with me right here, live in person, not virtual this time. <laughs> okay, uh, Mr. Chuko, you heard what the Central Bank governor did say earlier. Do you think that the CBN is right, is on top of the money uh, there? And also at this meeting, he did mention, and that struck me, he did mention why the central banks went so t high on, went so tight on crypto at the beginning and that the CBN was, you know, a lot of people hounded on them and all of that. But do you think that the CBN is also justified doing that vis-a-vis -vis what we've seen somehow right now around the crypto market? And what do you have to say about what he mentioned earlier? Okay, starting from the crypto market, um, you know the basic thing that the financial regulator has a duty to maintain financial system stability. If any uh, new financial instruments crops into the market that is largely under, or not understood, not well understood, that begins to build up a uh, size that could have a systemic impact, and because when f we talk of financial instrument, there's going to be some movement from one financial asset to that of financial uh, instrument. Like we talk of uh, cryptocurrency. When people are holding cryptocurrency, they are buying it with dollar. So they are converting in other countries, their local currency to dollar and buying, holding crypto. So if you have a sudden collapse of that asset class, it has a way of impacting on, at the minimum, investor confidence or the banking public confidence in the banking system. And you also see a situation where there's a, if there's a huge loss of financial assets, it could affect households. And they could have all overall impact on financial system stability. So it, it's it, 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 for me, it was understandable when the central banks, not just Nigeria central bank, most global central banks had their apprehensions about cryptocurrency because they saw movement in conventional asset classes into an unconventional asset class, which was largely unregulated and which were being created by individuals. Private money was, was being created. So uh, it was something that, because the creators of those things were not under any form of regulation. And so that was why those concerns were there. So the concerns were well founded. Of course, we've seen the collapses we've seen the, in, in the cryptocurrency market. And we we'll see the impact of that, which has also led to most other financial, uh, global financial uh, regulators saying, look, we must regulate this instrument because it could have systemic impact on the entire banking system. Mm. Okay. If we, uh, now let's talk about the banking system, what he said. Do you think he's also right on the money in terms of um, having, maintaining street vigilance on, on banks? You were a former MD of a bank. Do you think that Nigerian banks are adequately regulated or under-regulated or over-regulated? Where do you think 
uh, <coughs> I just said adequately regulated, over-regulated, under-regulated, or regulated. Well, I think I'll take Because they have the former bank MD as, as a, as yeah, a I think they central bank government. I think they tend toward being over-regulated. Oh, being over-regulated? Yes, I think Nigerian banks tend toward being over-regulated. Um, if I have the liberty of time, I can read out several um, directives from that come from central bank on regular intervals. At regular intervals, we have regulations on the amount of liquidity they have. In terms of liquidity management in the banking system, uh, central banks approach has been very sporadic. Um, a lot of times, the banks are not certain how much their uh, um, liquidity ratio should be. Not in terms of liquidity ratio, in terms of how much the central bank is going to take as cash reserve from their bank from their banking vault. Well, it's been almost certain for like two years yes, until lately that it was increased. Yeah, but to you, you've also seen instances where debits come at periods when the banks have prepared their liquidity to go for foreign exchange bids. Except when they when they when they have a malpractice, then they are debited. You no, know, it's beyond malpractice. The I give you instances. The banks will tell you, the bank treasurer will tell you that when they are preparing to go for bid for foreign foreign exchange for their customers, a lot of times they wake up and realize that their ba balance with the central bank has been debited. For what exactly? For cash reserve. Mm. So that for me. How is often is cash is reserve supposed? The, the cash reserve is it not I the, resi the reserve of your money? In the, pa in the past, bank? in the past, it used to be the percentage at the of end your money. Of, yeah, in the past it used to be at the end of the f a, a, a month. Mm -hmm. Then the central bank will determine your level of liquid, uh, li liquid uh, um, capital depo deposits. Okay. Your level of deposit, and based on your end of month balance sheet, they will take the cash reserve. But it's no longer the practice. So for me, that's an excess, excessive regulation. Then you have the issues of several directives, including the recent directives on the tenor of bank CEOs mm. and bank executive directors and non-executive directors. So, and I think this, these things are coming, some of them are a bit sporadic. Uh, so if you ask me, I, t I believe that we tend towards over-regulation in the banking system. But having said that, It is better to be overregulated than to be underregulated because of the importance of the financial system as major arbitrators in the economy. If you have underregulation like we used to have in the 90s, where you had 89 banks, so the risk of underregulation is far more than the risk of overregulation. Overregulation for the Nigerian banking system also has worked for them. It to the extent that, look, as it stands today, the banks are making so much of positive net interest margin because the central bank has effectively encouraged the banks to charge more in terms of their cost, uh, their lending rate while not really forcing them to pay more in terms of deposit rate. So the, the banks are also not complaining because they know that they have benefited sharies or that the even the overregulation has some other flip side of Do it. Do you think they can complain? Can that's they also part of, of that's, that's part of the also part of <laughs> the. Perhaps when they are with the we are with the, our guard, they will complain. That's in also the part room. of the regulation. The bank MDs do not have the courage mm. to, to speak up. To speak publicly. Yes. Do you Even have that abroad, where banks speak publicly against the Fed, for example, or even other central banks, or even the Reserve Bank of South Africa? No. I, I, is, I, is it not? As we as we in the world, a bank CEO can speak up his mind. Yeah, about the economy, yeah. about what he or she yeah. thinks. How many times have you interviewed bank MDs sitting on the desk? They, they don't they even won't. want to come. Yeah, because they we don't want, want to say anything that will offend the CBS. Yes. I say they don't want to say anything. I don't want to speak. But they can talk to you, uh, you know, but they won't want to come out publicly. Yeah, so that's speak. it. So what, what do you consider that as? Okay. Now let's move over to another issue, the elections. Like I mentioned earlier, uh, we haven't seen since after the presidential elections. Talk to me about your modeling around the outlook, especially after elections, the presidential election, and now we have a couple of states that have been uh, declared governorship as well as assembly uh, polls. Is it a beer or a bull kind of modeling for you? Because I'm <coughs> struggling to understand where many business people fall <laughs> in terms of their modeling or analysis. Speak to me about yours. Okay, mine is that um, we should expect if I have to use between the beer and the bull, mm. I would 
stay on the beer side. Oh, on the beer side. Yes, and uh, the basic thing is that the election has not made a minimum expectation of women in beers. Is so that filtering into business? Yeah, so it's, it's giving. Uh, you know, some of the some of us had actually projected that immediately after the election, if the election process had made the minimum expectation of Nigerians, not the outcome, the process, that would have seen a lot of excitement after the election. Excitement, people's excitement. Yeah, people. If people felt that. Or is there excitement around investment? No, what just what in the first place. You know, the, the one of the things you know that if if we take the equity market, mm -hmm. the equity market uh, rallies when there is optimism in the economy. Mm -hmm. And it uh, declines when there's pessimism in the economy or when there are doubts I in the society. So when people are exuberant, they make investments. When people are excited about the future, they make investments. So uh, sometimes they tell you that the, the equity performance can actually be used to measure to the gauge, post yeah. Yeah, the, of, the, of the society. And we've also seen in the past one week, the equity market has struggled. In fact, since after the election, the equity market has largely struggled. So what does that mean? It simply means, even if you go out there and feel the mood of the people, you don't see the excitement that, we should, that should follow a national election if the election had gone according to the expectation of Nigerians. You see, what, what Nigerians are Is really... Is expectation of Nigerians or expectation of over 12 million Nigerians that did not vote, for example, the president-elect? No, because I about 8.7 voted for the president-elect. No, I think, president I think, it, I think it's beyond that. Mm -hmm. A lot of people were frustrated from voting. They, they, they was not, there was no voter apathy, but there was violence. I no, know a friend of mine no who told apathy. there was no voter apathy. But we had about 25 or about close to 25 million in terms of voter Na turnout Nancy co was co co compared to 87 million yeah, that collected PVC. You see, Nancy, that's why I say there was no voter apathy. They, I can give you, if what I have heard from people who we are speaking of, their personal experiences, and what I've also read in the media, I know of a community in my uh, uh, senatorial zone. They did not bring materials there. In my own village, uh, we kept calling because I, I voted in the village. We, they got there by 2, 2 p.m. On, on uh, for the presidential election, national, uh, national assembly election. They got there by 2 p.m. For this other community, they got there like 5 p.m. And it was agreed that they should defy the election to the next day. That election has not hit it today. They did not hold the election yes. in that community? Yes, it's a large it chunk of that community. And a I community can tell you of polling units? Yes, I can tell you specifically, everybody and Hofia. A large chunk of the, those communities did not witness the presidential and, and national assembly election. They did not vote there. I can tell you that for free. How many communities make up? How many? Of course, there will be many polling units in that community. Of, I'm talking of several uh, polling units. And we have a In a some instances, already. you have places where there were 15 or 20 uh, um, polling units, and they brought five BFAS machines. So what how else do you want to frustrate people from voting? Do you think those people are happy today? They are despondent. A friend of mine went, told me he went to vote in Nikon town, in, in Lake Yazis, that where they were about to start voting, people came and drove them away. Water suppression. Yes. And, and they went back on in the mid-afternoon. And you can imagine not everybody would have come back. So from what you are, from your analysis right now, all of this translates, all of this, the impact will be on the economy. Or the impact is already being felt in the market. The, the impact already being felt in the market. The impact, uh, uh, the expectation that we all had that we're going to have a smooth and free and fair election uh, seem to have been betrayed by INEC. Mm. And that has dampened the spirit of Nigerians, including dampened their confidence in their society, in their country. People are saying, look, what kind of country is this? Why can't we do simple things easily? What does it take to hold elections? Why would I be driven away when I want to cast my vote? Why would votes be uh, 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 balloting be done and people will come and burn it? And nobody has, uh, has been arrested. Okay, Mr. Chuku, l let's take a look at because this is actually a business and a financial show. So we don't do things the way politicians do it. We are perhaps more, how would I put it, more... More objective. More, more objective. More, more rational. More, more rational, you know. More... More straightforward, uh, uh, as, uh, as, as it were. Now... Um, I'm more analytical. I'm more analytical. Um, yesterday, as in the last couple of days, we've done, we've 
being on the election situation room, I've been an anchor there. So yesterday I had the opportunity to ask if my INEC, Director of Voter Education and Publicity, when we're talking about the process of this election, and I asked a simple question, which I also want to ask you, because yesterday when his reasons, I was not too convinced, which is, we are all bank account holders. We have close to about 50, 56 million Nigerians that have accounts in banks. Mm -hmm. You can walk into a bank right now and your ATM has expired or even once you are being given an ATM mm -hmm. card right now. That happened to me even last week. So I was asking, I said, what is it exactly that the financial system in this same country, Nigeria, we are not out. You can have the same service. Meanwhile, INEC and the electoral process is still lagging behind. Some will say, okay, it's law or whatever, whatever it is. But in this same country, you have a financial system where a Nigerian can walk into a bank, a bank account holder. Another issue could be get more people financially included. That is not part of this. You get into a bank and you're being given your bank card with a chip on it. You have a BBN. When I go to the bank and you want to make a certain transaction, they'll say, Madam, face <coughs> the camera. They snap your, <laughs> your picture. They check if it's the same one on their system or you do a thumbprint. And I was asking, is it different or what exactly is it? Are they lessons that we can learn from the financial system to the other process that is seemingly bureaucratic? 